Good evening. Thank you so much for joining Historic Richmond's virtual lecture program, Maps Matter, exploring the past and future of the Randolph neighborhood. We're so grateful to people like you who attend our programs, support our work, and care about our historic places. We particularly want to thank our wonderful sponsors, Dominion Energy and TCV Trust and Wealth Management for supporting our programs. Tonight's program is being recorded and will be available to view on our website next week. I am Danielle Porter, Director of Preservation Services at Historic Richmond. For those of you who do not know us, Historic Richmond is a nonprofit with a mission to shape the future of Richmond by preserving our distinctive historic character, sparking revitalization, and championing our past and future architectural legacy. Maps are so much more than Google Maps getting you from point A to point B. They are an invaluable, they are invaluable as research tools and storytellers. When researching a property, the Sanborn maps are one of the first places I usually check. These fire insurance maps are coded to tell you the height, material, general size, and use of a building. They can help date a building by confirming its presence. Maps are powerful. When we first started advocating for the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground, we were able to use maps to see how the site evolved over the decades. The name of the burying ground changed in almost every map and eventually began to disappear from the maps, a powerful way to suppress Black history. Maps draw connections. For example, the heat index map is correlated to areas of the city that were redlined a term we will discuss more this evening for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Maps can predict your social and economic standing and determine the value of your property. Maps provide a path for future development. Rezoning and SUPs are based on the land use and future land use maps. If you kept up with our annual report and newsletters, then you know we've spent the last several years focused on these maps through the Richmond 300. Maps created by Harland Bartholomew, an urban planner hired by Richmond to create the first comprehensive plan for the city in the 1930s and 40s, were used to destroy the Black community. Tonight's presentation will focus on Randolph, one of the last thriving and intact Black neighborhoods in Richmond to be disrupted by urban renewal. With that, I'm honored to introduce to you Latoya Gray Sparks. She is a cartographer, historian, and creator of the award-winning story map, Plan Destruction, and founder of the Reconstructing Randolph Project, which is rooted in her own family's experience and began as her capstone project during her master's in urban planning at VCU. Her work was then integrated into a national conversation about centering Black and Indigenous voices and historical narratives as she participated in the National Endowment for Humanities Summer Institute at Dumbarton Oaks. We were lucky to have her as part of the Historic Richmond team last year and are so excited for tonight's presentation on Randolph as she uses her mapping skills to empower and tell the stories of underrepresented communities. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to LaToya Gray Sparks. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that kind introduction. You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, we love you, LaToya. <laughs> yeah, I love y'all too. <laughs> Um, so greetings, everyone. I'm so grateful to be talking to you tonight, and I thank you for taking the time out of this beautiful evening to hear to hear this presentation. Um, I hope this isn't too disappointing because I will focus heavily on maps, but I will also reflect on archival data and oral histories that have been shared with me to tell a more comprehensive story of a neighborhood that meant a lot to me during my childhood and was essentially like my second home. It wasn't until recently that I became more aware of this space and the fact that it was purposefully disrupted and erased from Richmond's physical landscape. Today, this space is known as the Randolph neighborhood. Um, and I think it's been broken into two different, two districts now, old and new Randolph. Um, but for lifelong Richmonders like myself, black Richmonders, this was and will always be the West End. To get us grounded, I will start with a quote. Draw me a map of what you see then I will draw a map of what you never see. 
and guess me whose map will be bigger than whose. This is a quote from Key Miller's poem titled, The Cartographer Tries to Draw a Map to Zion. The poem is beautiful and written as a conversation between a European cartographer and a Rasta man. And it's beautiful in the way in which it highlights the flaws of maps created with a Eurocentric lens. I must say that growing up, I hated my classes on maps and geography when I was a little girl because I often did not see myself in those maps, nor in the stories that I learned about those maps. So while I will definitely include maps throughout this pres presentation, I also want to emphasize, and I learned more about this concept during my time at Dumbarton Oaks this summer, but I want to emphasize um, the geography of memory. Many of my ideas and thoughts about the West End are shaped by stories that were passed down to me through my dad, grandparents, great-grandparents, uncles, and other relatives. There's an image of Randolph that they have that no, fit, no longer physically exist, but within their memories. But when listening to their stories, if I close my eyes and I use my imagination, I can see the streets full of, full of school kids on Parkwood Avenue. And that's one of my dad's favorite reoccurring memories. So to me, documenting these memories and stories is something that I'm very passionate about while I still have the time and the people around to tell those stories. And I do believe that this is a form of historic preservation. So let's start at the beginning. The Randolph neighborhood, as many neighborhoods throughout Richmond, was not always known as Randolph. It was once the town of Sydney, and it was a lot acquired in 1817 by Benjamin J. Harris, who, according to Mary Wingfield Scott, named it after Sydney, Australia. Um, I've seen differing accounts about the origins of this space, and um, considering that a lot of my work has been focused more on the urban renewal period, I feel like this is definitely a part of history that I need to dive deeper into, but it looks like it was, um, meant to be a town, but that did not last very long, but it was certainly a part of Henrico County initially and not Richmond. Most of the streets in Sydney, Holly, Cherry, Plum, etc., were named after trees. The Sydney neighborhood, as I indicated, was a part of Henrico. During the 1800s, a significant number of Blacks lived in Sydney, and according to Selden Richardson's Built by Blacks, Blacks Black residents made up 40% of the total population of Henrico during the 1800s. During Reconstruction and the early 1900s, there were a series of political battles and court cases over territory between Richmond and Henrico. Again, this is another fascinating aspect of history that I think could, um, if, for you historians out there, would be wonderful to dive into because I didn't realize there was, I knew about like the annexation of um, Chesterfield in the 1970s um, by Richmond, but these other annexation cases were pretty contentious. Um, but so anyway, this wrangling over territory would lead to the eastern part of Randolph being added in 1867 and the western portion being annexed in 1906. In 1908, small bungalows were advertised and sold to Blacks on Jacqueline Street. The Black community forming in Randolph developed around Riverview Baptist Church. This is a rare ad showing pictures of homes that Black residents were purchasing in the early 1900s in the West End. In my research, I've come across so many real estate ads with addresses and descriptions of properties and their value, but this ad with an actual picture is quite a gem and I was so excited when I came across it. Um, these would be, and, and sadly they do not exist today, but these are like representative, I think of like cute bungalows or cottages that are like very trendy nowadays. Um, but these were the first homes of many Blacks who were settling in the Sydney area. Um, this also helps to convey that early on Black residents 
were after the Civil War, post during and post reconstruction, were asserting their independence and seeking to build wealth. And of course, we all know and been told that one of the first steps towards building generational wealth is through home ownership. By the 1940s, as several enclaves of black communities formed throughout Richmond, Randolph, as those other on, um, neighborhoods was becoming established and home ownership really um, allowed the community to take root. And a little bit more on Riverview because I think it's a pretty fascinating um, building and structure that I think is worth um, being recognized um, as a historic um, structure. But um, Riverview Baptist Church, it started initially as a small one room church on Jacqueline Street. It would move to um, this building is at its present location at Jacqueline and Lombardi. This particular building was designed by Richmond architect Charles Thaddeus Russell. This classical style building was designed in 1914 and built in 1915. It is constructed of reused stones and bricks from the Southern Railroad Passenger Depot. So talk about sustainability. Um, it still exists today and I think is um, stands out because many of the buildings that were designed by Charles Thaddeus Russell were unfortunately demolished during the urban redevelopment and urban renewal period. Um, Riverview Baptist Church um, currently and its current location um, is on um, I think Idlewood. So it's no longer at this location. There's another church within this building, but I would definitely say if you have an opportunity to just walk by and check out the structure, um, it's well worth your time. Um, it's, I believe, and Danielle, you're the architectural historian, but I don't think there are a lot of buildings left in Richmond made of granite or, or stone. So um, to me, it stood out because of that, but um, it's still around and it's, um, yeah, it's just an amazing um, work, I think, of art designed by Charles Thaddeus Russell. Um, and I found this today and just had to um, put this into my presentation and that little, sorry, that little circle's off. But anyway, um, a friend of mine posted this on Twitter. I was doing some last minute cramming for this presentation, but I think it gives like a good, um, a good depiction of the social geography of Richmond in the 1900s. And, you know, already like um, there were distinctions being made um, in residential areas as far as race and social class. So the black areas are where um, black residents lived during the early 1900s. Um, you have like um, the distinctions between white middle class and white working class. Um, um, neighborhoods as well, but just it's an example of one of many maps that were indicating um, and highlighting where black people lived and I think just like the blackening of the spaces um, often seen in earlier maps is like it's not necessarily depicting the geography in a positive light. Um, so I thought that was just interesting to bring up. All right, so on to the next part. Um, let's see, oh, I'm so sorry. So during the 1930s and 1960s, there were a series of laws, court cases, policies and programs issued that greatly impacted housing and development in Richmond. Now the nuances involved, I think are a bit too much for this presentation because um, there are so many, but the key points that I wanna point out are the many housing acts and programs that were initiated that were definitely more beneficial to white Americans versus black and brown Americans. And some of these programs and some of the programs and policies that came out of this period included the redlining maps, which were largely influenced by real estate professionals at the local level, but were ways of drawing and depicting neighborhoods um, as far as um, whether or not they, um, the buildings pose, I guess, a mortgage risk, but often those maps were used to um, place value upon neighborhoods and um, often neighborhoods, well, yes, pretty much all the neighborhoods in Richmond were red line and that would lead to um, slum clearance and the devaluation of property, which just was not, which was harmful to those neighborhoods. Um, slum clearance, which I just mentioned, resulted in the demolition of homes and buildings and predominantly black neighborhoods. And instead of um, housing stock being um, 
replaced rather, um, I guess, or being created as replacements, there were there was the introduction of public housing units. Um, so like in 1937, um, from the National Housing Act, we got the creation of Gilpin, Hillside, Creighton, Fairfield, Wickham, and Mosby Courts, as well as public housing units in Blackwell. Then there was the Federal Highway Act, which leveled remaining Black neighborhoods throughout the country and Richmond, which would lead to the establishment of the Interstate Highway. During the 1940s, the city of Richmond created the Richmond Redevelopment Housing Authority, or RHA, after receiving authorization from the Virginia General Assembly. RRHA was a quasi-governmental agency with the authority to condemn property and issue bonds to construct housing. RRHA utilized eminent domain to condemn and acquire properties, often owned and or occupied by Black residents. This resulted in a tearing down of neighborhoods block by block until only a trace of the original neighborhoods remained. The first picture on, that I'm in, pointing to, I guess this will be on your left as well, but it's a legal ad from 1956. And I think it's one of the first cases um, implemented by RH, RHA that invoked eminent domain over property owners um, whose property had either already been condemned or was at the beginning of the condemnation process and or properties in which people were behind and their property taxes. Um, and I think it's safe to point out the fact that residents today are currently concerned about rising property assessments. So some of these issues um, never go away. Um, but I guess when I was looking into the value of or yeah, some of the values of the back taxes that were owed and just putting them into a calculator um, or a formula that would let me figure out like what today's value would be. Sometimes the amount was as low, well, I think low as a hundred dollars. So there were people who were losing like everything um, for because of these very draconious and awful um, housing practices. Um, but I guess I just say that to emphasize that it did not take a lot for local government officials and or authorities to deprive and take away so much from people who were trying to assert independence and create generational wealth. So between the 1940s and 1960s, because of these practices, all multi-generational and stable black neighborhoods had either been destroyed or mutilated. The Black West End, AKA Randolph, was one of the last established black neighborhoods in Richmond to be impacted by urban renewal. This would happen during the 1960s and 70s. And for those of you, if you haven't read um, um, Reverend Benjamin Campbell's Richmond's Unhealed History, I highly recommend it. I think reading this book years ago is what inspired me to learn more about the history of Randolph because I had not known about this, about urban renewal impacting Randolph until reading this book. And it's just a very well done, comprehensive, I think, history of Richmond and ties it into issues that we are still dealing with today. So while Randolph avoided slum clearance carried out in the 1940s to the 60s, it would not be as fortunate a decade later. The 1960s marked the beginning of the Randolph Urban Renewal Project, which was also called later on the Randolph Conservation Project, which was, as Danielle and I discussed, a very ironic way of, um, of labeling this project. Um, the underlying assumptions used by planners advocating for urban renewal within Randolph were racially charged and fostered the false, pre, pre, the false premise that black spaces were synonymous with blight, high crime, and poor quality housing. The findings from the HUD report described Randolph as blighted, overcrowded, and a majority of crimes occurring within Randolph, or the majority of crimes occurring within the city were happening in the blighted portion of Randolph. But I guess they missed the message or the reports of cross burnings that were also occurring during this time. One of the primary goals of the project was to expand the downtown expressway through the Idlewood Corridor. 
Black Richmonders remembering what happened to Black neighborhoods in downtown Richmond um, organized, showed up to meetings, and resisted and fought with everything that they could to prevent the project. Um, there are just so many articles that I've come around, come across recently that span over like 10 years during the period of the 1960s and 70s that, that display like just the little, the victories that Black Richmonders were having within the West End to push this project down further down the road and or delay it and have the legality of it questioned. And they were, they were winning. So it was just amazing. Like it showed people willing to fight back and resist. And I feel like often those stories kind of get lost as we um, as we learn more about the awful period of urban renewal. But um, I guess I would like to remind folks that there were people standing up and they weren't being passive, like they were trying to become involved. And that certainly was happening in Richmond over the Randolph um, urban renewal project. So there, so the opponents of the expressway were led by then city council member Henry Marsh, and he managed to um, get a majority of council members for a long period of time on his side. So they were slowly pushing, they were slowly but surely pushing back. And again, another great story, I think that would be well worth digging into just to know like more about like um, those details and just, I mean, just to read the minutes from those, um, meetings I think would be very um, insightful and eye-opening. But unfortunately, they were fighting an uphill battle. By 1971, 900 households were displaced by the Randolph project. This picture is the last house to be demolished as a part of the project. There were two sisters who were able to resist government authorities and it was only after the city built brand new homes for the sisters that they finally left and gave up their property um, to be demolished to make way for the project. But they were able to push back for two years, which was um, quite impressive. But um, unfortunately, the 900 other households that um, whose homes were demolished, they were not as fortunate. And from what I've read through archival data and talking to people, like there were was never any compensation um, for homes that were lost. And if there were, it would never have been, um, it wouldn't have amounted to what residents were seeking or thought was just and or fair. So with the exception of government owned properties, um, um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, so I guess now I'm going to turn and I guess talk more about erasure and fragmentation because the dismantling of, by the 1970s, there were about 9,000 people living within the Randolph community. By the time like homes and households had been displaced and removed, the population had been cut like in half, like um, like less than 4,000 people, I think, remained in the area. And of course, it had um, a very devastating impact on the Black residents that lived in that area and called it home, as well as the neighbors that they um, lived with who were considered like extended family members. So during my research um, process or capstone um, project, I found that oral histories and interviews help immensely to fill in gaps that were missing in all of the archival research that I was coming across. The interviews also revealed that residents in Randolph may have been displaced not just one time, but several times during the period of the 1950s to 1970s. Um, some things, and I'm still learning as I continue to talk to people, but there were people who were living in the downtown um, area who were displaced because of that first wave of urban redevelopment. And so many of them didn't move to the West End or you know, further West. And then they were impacted again and had to move a little bit further West. And there are some people still living today who are worried about being displaced one more time, you know, because the how the cost of housing is growing. And of course, a lot of people find Richmond to be um, a, an ideal place to move to. So a lot of these um, folks who are older now um, and are fixed incomes are trying their best to hold on, but um, 
are just very worried. And of course they have memories of displacement from earlier. So um, that's something I really care about. And I guess that's why I think it's so important to talk about this history. Um, so I'm gonna share with you, I guess, some memories related to my own family because a lot of the oral histories, I mean, I heard of them growing up, but I did not know about the displacement. And it wasn't until my story map plan destruction um, was getting more recognition that my relatives started opening up to me to talk about like these very painful moments in history for them and how urban renewal and displacement impacted them directly. So as I said, the Randolph neighborhood was connected and thriving. It was also, and you'll find this in all, in many oral histories um, of black neighborhoods, it was a safe place for people. It was the, um, the social network that was created through these neighborhoods cannot be measured or quantified in any way. Um, and also I wanna pu push back on like, a lot of the archival pictures that I come across of these blighted properties do not look blighted at all. Um, so I mean, to me, it means that they're, they're contradicting like what the technical reports had reported. So these pictures represent um, pictures from the 1900 block of Ottawood Avenue in the 1950s. Um, this, the taller guy is my uncle Walker in these pictures. And he's pretty much the family's historian. Um, he's been like, taking, um, like using these old school video cameras, um, or I don't even know what he would call them, but anyway, he's recorded a lot of footage. Um, I think he wanted to be a filmmaker at one time, but he's been sharing with me all of these awesome pictures um, from of places that don't exist anymore. So this would have been at the 1900 block of Idlewood Avenue. Um, my great grandparents lived in this house, Ida and Simon Bauer. And in the 1950s, they were displaced. Um, this was a red line area. And so um, this beautiful home in the background was demolished. And this is what it exists today. I mean, not bad, um, but it is government owned property. Um, the last time I checked, um, but like, yeah, it was converted into um, public housing. So, um, yeah, so I, I just I don't have much more to say to that. But um, I, I think that I've read accounts of just that um, I think there are residents living in the space today who have had issues with like um, bad living conditions, mold and whatnot. So, um, so this looks great on the outside, but there have been issues like I guess as far as like maintenance of these units and from the last time, um, the last that I heard, I think that this is being converted into mixed income housing. So there's no telling what's going to happen to current tenants living in this space. Um, so this is a picture from the 2200 block of Idlewood Avenue. This is where my great grandparents settled after they were displaced um, from the 1900 block of Idlewood. Um, again, um, these were duplexes. There were several of them in this block. Um, it, apparently my great grandparents had five kids, but it was suitable enough for their family. And there are a lot of memories um, that my dad and uncles have from living in, in this space. Um, so it was definitely home. Um, that's my grandpa in that, and sorry, it's not the best picture. This is the best you're gonna get because it is like an old picture, but um, that's my grandpa right there. And my uncle Mock, um, we call him Mock, but Marcus, um, when he was a little kid, it might've been around Easter because my grandpa did not go to church very often. So it had to be like a really important occasion for him to be dressed up. But um, again, this is something that my uncle shared with me and I had no idea about these homes existing. Um, so. This is, would be located in this yellow area of a red lining map. And it is so messed up, but like you can just see how there's like this cookie cutter, you know, approach to these properties. So these, um, yeah, these units were declared blighted. Um, they were demolished. And this is what exists today. Um, my great grandparents were told that this area would be converted into a playground for kids that never happened. 
Um, they were pushed into public housing right across from where their home used to exist. So um, like my great grandparents lived in this humble apartment for the remainder of their lives. And like every day they could see right across the street an unutilized and underdeveloped lot that their home used to be on. Um, and this is unfortunately not a singular moment. There are so many other people who have opened up and talked about this, like being promised one thing or, you know, thinking that they're giving to the greater good, only to find like um, plans did not pan out for whatever reason. And just, you know, the irony of just looking at empty lots on which their homes used to exist. So. So I guess I will stop right here. I feel like I could go on forever, but I didn't, I don't know. I just didn't want to take up too much time and I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities for discussion, but um, I will end with this. There are a lot of vacant lots in Richmond at the moment. Um, and a pet peeve of mine is when I hear planners, because um, I think that we need to, coming from an pl urban planning perspective, we really have to be careful about how we describe spaces. Like I often hear like, oh, nothing is there. There was nothing there. It's just an unutilized or a vacant parking lot. And I think if you just dig a little bit deeper into the history of a space, you'll find that it wasn't always like that. Um, and I think I think of the Rasa man from that poem that I mentioned earlier, like you're gonna have to see beyond the physical topography because what isn't seen may actually reveal a larger story and a hidden narrative. Oh, we shouldn't have done that. But anyway, um, that's like a little graphic that I created like of a Sanborn map over like the space and what used to be there. I thought it was like a cool visualization. But um, so yeah, I guess I will end with that. Um, thank you all for listening. There's so much more I have to cover, but um, yeah, I didn't want to take up too much time. So thank you. Um. Thank you so much, Latoya. Um, I guess I have one person who's asking where in the city here, I guess you're talking about where, uh, where I'm, Randolph yeah. is. Yeah. Oh. So, and I guess I did not say that explicitly because I've seen like varying um, descriptions of Randolph. Um, darn it, I don't know if I can share my screen again, but I guess, I, um, based on like what I've seen in the HUD reports related to the Randolph Conservation Project, um, to the east would be, um, I guess, I go as far as like Harrison Street, to the west, to Bird Park. Um, for the purposes of this paper, I am thinking about Idlewood, like right where um, the highway or expressway is now. And towards the bottom would be Colorado Avenue. So I'm sorry, I did not include that in my presentation. But. That's okay. So I have a question. Um, what what do you think the best planning practices would be today to help un, undo some of the damage that was done? Yeah. Or are there any case case studies of practices that are working? Oh boy. Oh, that was homework I was supposed to have done. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I will say one, there are a lot of residents, Black residents living in Richmond today who remember what their communities were like before urban renewal and or urban development took place. So I would say one, seek the elders in communities to talk to them. Um, I often find that like there's planning that's taking place now to like address like um, the impact of redlining and urban renewal, but it's kind of happening like around those communities, but and not necessarily really engaging those communities. So I think that people want an opportunity, one, just to be heard and have their stories out there. There are people who I speak with who just they just want some kind of documentation an acknowledgement that a harm was done. Um, now there are others who think that more should be done um, and that something is owed. And I would say um, involving them in those conversations and planning is helpful as well. Um, I was, I've been excited about Charlottesville because I did think that it was beginning to take some baby steps towards 
addressing the impact of urban renewal. There's an awesome documentary called Raised that's about Vinegar Hill and Charlottesville. So it is start, certainly started those discussions and those oral histories are being recorded. Um, there's this amazing mapping project that's going on in Charlottesville where they are, they're, um, they're highlighting like, and I didn't mention this, but like racial covenants um, and where, where those were used and mapping those just to, put it out there, but also to acknowledge like there were all these mechanisms that were used to keep people kind of restricted and, um, and segregated. So, so I think I'm hopeful about what's going on in Charlottesville because they're having the conversations. They did have like, I thought like an amazing affordable housing plan that addressed or was speaking of how to prevent displacement. And I think that's something that needs to be explicit in any, further plans that we have, like just policies and just, you know, um, the agreement that displacement and preventing it um, is something that should be like a part of the conversation and developments and whatnot. And I would say for examples, I would look at what Asheville, North Carolina is doing. Um, they again started with like oral histories and mapping, and then it moved on to something more tangible, like some kind of redress for businesses that were destroyed during urban renewal. So as the city is currently working on planning for Gilpin Court, Creighton, Mosby, and Hillside, um, what do you think we need to make sure we're, what can we do to make sure we're not making the same mistakes again? Well, I mean, I guess, I, again, I would say like in truly engaging with the communities living in those spaces would definitely be like the first step. Um, and I think that's going on. I've seen some hopeful things about like community engagement, but I mean, again, um, what I worry about is that we have a lot of development and growth occurring in the city, but I think that there are certain populations and neighborhoods that are paying the price that are being sacrificed and that's happened already. Um, I did a presentation yesterday for um, some entry for urban planning students who are taking an intro to planning class and I did not realize, I knew that displacement was taking place, but okay, so over the past 10 years, Richmond's population has grown by like 11.1%, which is great. But at the same time, the black population in Richmond has decreased by 11%. And, and there are people who have been sounding this alarm for a while. So they're, you know, through lived experience, like they're seeing like their neighbors leaving and moving mm. and there's data that supports like this is an issue and it has been for a while. Um, and I forget what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think, I think you answered it of what can we do to make sure we're not making the same mistakes as with planning around some of these courts. And I think the answer is community engagement. Listen, listen to what the community has to say. Yeah, but on the, on the changing dynamics of the city, I've got another question. What do you think we can do to help retain the historic houses of Randolph, the West End, that survived the prior urban renewal yeah, effort. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, and I forgot, I did want to share this. <laughs> oh, I cannot do this on the fly. But anyway, um, <laughs> when I was um, doing some investigating into like the historic properties in Randolph, I think there are just three. Like there's this huge swath of land and whatnot. And there are only three properties that um, have some kind of historic designation. And there were surveys that were done um, like maybe towards the end of the 1970s or 80s. By the time that was done, like the awesome structures that would have been rec um, recognized as historic had already been demolished. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there, there are still structures that still exist in the area. So I think maybe a survey should be done to um, figure out what those um, structures are. And I would definitely recommend that for other historic black neighborhoods where people are just barely hanging on or feel like you know they're being erased from the landscape, but there's so much historic fabric that's been overlooked, you know, because they just didn't. Where, do you know where the black population is going? Like if we've lost 11% in the city, is it just out to Chesterfield and Henrico or are they actually leaving the region or who, who knows? <laughs> that's a good question. And I was asked that yesterday and I did not have a good answer. Um, so I, I think that's something worth looking into. I mean, I know of um, friends who have moved to like Henrico. So they've just like, you know, crossed the line. Mm. 
county. So I think there's that going on, like um, an exodus to the counties. But um, but then another, there was a student who raised the point that like the job opportunities are not necessarily here, in her opinion, um, for Black residents. So sometimes they have to move elsewhere to wherever it's most beneficial. So yeah, we did a tour of Richmond Technical high school center um for koi club the other week and or i guess like a month and a half ago now but they were (laughs) uh, they were saying that they do this survey with some of the students and ask them where they think they're going to get jobs afterwards and the majority of students think that they need to leave like virginia to even be able to find a job which is um i think part and I hope partly an unfortunate misconception you know that there is work closer but probably also that there needs to be more jobs available that cater to the people who live here yeah Yeah. let's see um I guess this is just a comment that I'll give you to respond to, not really a question, but um, the problem with public housing is density and lower density is proven more beneficial, but of course displaces people. And well, I'll, I don't know if you, I think density is a really good thing in general. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I'd have to, I'd like to talk more about that or just. (laughs) Um, Well, Latoya, this was really great. Um, I loved hearing about this and I love talking about all these types of issues with you as well on the webinar and when we share this office together. So thanks so much. Um, If anyone has any more questions and sends them in an email, I'll pass them on and try to answer them on Instagram. But otherwise, this has been so great. And thank you so much for sharing all your research and your personal stories with us. You're welcome. And thank everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.